welcome again to the stage Melinda Gates, accompanied by Lisa Sue and Nellie Galan. Well, that was an incredible story that Daryl shared with us. She's an amazing businesswoman. You can see why we all find her so inspiring. And so I think the question before us now, and the question that's raised in this report, is how can we help grow more entrepreneurs like Daryl so other women can start their own businesses? You know, how do we assure that they can contribute their talents to society, both in their local communities and in the global economy, whether these women are entrepreneurs, farmers, employees, or executives? And this is not just important for women, but it's also vitally important for families and for our global growth and prosperity. We know that when women have income in their hands, they more often invest it in their families. They invest it in things like health care, school fees, and in their children. It makes a huge difference for their family and for the future of their mm -hmm. children. So in short, I like to think of it this way. When you invest in a woman, you're investing in everyone else. And on a macroeconomic level, Studies have shown that if we can choose and put women and close that labor force participation gap between men and women and choose to put women forward, then economies will grow. So across high income countries, closing this GDP gap, closing this gap between men and women could lead to GDP growth of about 12% between now and 2030. And in countries like Japan and Italy, if you put women in the labor force, you can actually grow their GDP by about 20%. So to do this, though, there are still many challenges in front of us. In more than 150 countries, women lack basic things, basic protections that are critical to economic participation. For instance, I meet women who don't have the legal right to own their own property, much less take out a loan. So women everywhere are still denied equal pay for equal work. That's another huge gap that exists for women. And as Daryl mentioned, so many of these women lack the training to take their small business to the next level. Now, Nellie, I understand that that's part of what you do, is making sure that women entrepreneurs get trained. Can you tell us a little bit about how you do that? You know, Melinda, training to me is essential in this process, right? And I founded something called the Adelante Movement because we found out that, like Chelsea said before, sometimes in a first world country like the United States, we don't see that there are emerging markets under our nose. And in this country, the emerging market are Latinas. Mm. Latinas are the fastest growing entrepreneurs in this country. And yet, like America said earlier, we don't see women like you, like me. Like, we don't see women like us in our community. And so we decided to found the Adelante movement. And I love the word Adelante because it means Adelante. Let's get going. Let's go. Can we all say it? Adelante. I love that word. Um, and we really have kind of created a community with these Latinas by going on tour going city by city and bringing women of substance that are Latinas so they can meet them and then giving them meat and potatoes training because we want them to really understand basic business training, what's going on with the digital world, what's going on with social media. They've, they've become masters of social media and we're showing them how to start a business in every home online and engage the whole family because as you said, women bring money back to the home. We also have to do this under a cultural context because we have issues with you know, women not wanting to be, do better than their husbands or their fathers. And we have to explain to the men that the women are going to bring the money home. So it's been an incredible, incredible journey. Now, how did we do this? Because it's, we can't do it alone, right? So how do we create a private sex sector solution to this challenge? Well, we've partnered with 44 Hispanic NGOs because we want to bring light to the work that's being done by all these NGOs around the country and work together. We've worked with government agencies like the SBA because Latinas don't even know where the money is. There's money out there and they don't even know where to go and apply for it. And I've also been blessed because I saw what Coca-Cola was doing with 5 by 20 global initiative around the world. And I saw that women around the world had very similar problems to Latinas in America. And I've been lucky to be supported by them to sort of follow some of, the, some of the information that they already had and apply it in the US. So it's been incredible. And our goal is to train as many Latinas we ca as we can to be entrepreneurs and to start a business in every Latino family's house. 
Oh, that's fantastic, Nellie. Well, you can see her excitement. For I'm this excited. Adelante. <laughs> So, you know, entrepreneurship is really vital for women. It's vital to their economic participation, but it's also their ability to advance into leadership roles into corporations. And corporations play such a big role in the global economy. Now, today, I think most of you know in this room that 5% of CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies are women. And that is improvement from 20 years ago, but my husband would call it starting at a low base when you start at zero. So, <coughs> To me, it's still far from where we need to be. Um, we're lucky enough today, though, that Lisa Su would join us. She's one of the only, she is the only CEO of an American semiconductor company ever. And Lisa, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about how we can make it less lonely at the top for other women like you. Thank you, Melinda. It's really such an honor to be here amongst this incredible group of leaders. You know, 5% women leading Fortune 500 companies in 20 years. That's, wow. I'm truly amazed um, by that number. Um, I can say that is definitely progress, right? We're engineers, so we like to see progress, but I can also say we have so much more opportunity. And, you know, just to tell you a little bit about my story, you know, I was born in Taiwan, and I emigrated to the United States when I was two with my parents. And uh, I wish I had Debbie Sterling's toys when I was growing up. Um, but I became an engineer because I really like to build things, and I know that you share that as well. Um, engineering is one of those great professions because it is kind of very black and white. Either the product works or it doesn't work, and you can see the product of that labor. Um, I love building products and bringing teams together, and you know, through that and a lot of support and membership, um, I came along the way. Five months ago, I became the CEO of AMD. As CEO of AMD, I'm leading a company with a 45-year-old heritage of bringing leading technology into the industry. I really do believe, though, and I know you share this, over the next 10 years, we're going to see tremendous innovation in technology, which will change the way our daily lives, just like social media and smartphones change the way we live today. And what you really realize about innovation is it really only happens when you bring people together with different backgrounds and different experiences who can really solve problems together. Innovation will be much, much better when we can have a more diverse workforce, particularly in both the engineering as well as in the leadership community. Um, we heard earlier that in the last 20 years, today's No Ceilings report reflects that we have made progress in primary education. We've even made progress in universities. However, we still have a long ways to go in engineering and corporate leadership, and we can and should close this gap. So when I look at it, I say what's good for innovation is also good for business. So how can we do this? It really starts with doing it together. You know, fostering an environment like an entrepreneurship where women can grow and flourish, and when we see more men and women CEOs talking actively about promoting diversity and gender equality, we know that this can change. So my hope for the next 20 years from now, we won't be talking about how many women CEOs are in the Fortune 500, because it won't matter. It will be natural for corporate leadership to reflect the most talented individuals. Well, thanks to you both. Thanks, Nellie. Thanks, Lita, uh, Lisa, for your participation, and also the comments about business and how we move women forward in the economy. It's really important. Thanks Thank to you both. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you for teaching me a new word, Adelante. I will definitely work that into my, yep, daily vocabulary.